For centuries, the city of Rome was the dominant power in Europe. Thanks to their conquests lasting from the 3rd century BC to the 2nd century AD, the proud Romans controlled an empire that was stretching from modern-day Scotland to the Sahara Desert, and from the Pillars of Hercules to Mesopotamia. Had we asked a Roman citizen in the 4th century AD whether the empire would last for another thousand years, that person would have probably said yes, as Rome had no rival strong enough to threaten its very existence. Yet, as we know, the Roman Empire did not last for another millennium. The Western Roman Empire had already fallen by the 6th century, its place taken by Germanic successor kingdoms. The Eastern Empire fared somewhat better, but by the middle of the 7th century it had also lost two-thirds of its territories. So the question we can ask is why? Why did the Western Empire fall? What were the reasons behind the collapse of such a mighty empire? Were outside factors more important, like the famous barbarian invasions, or was the internal decay of the empire that led to its collapse? The reasons, of course, were numerous, and historians even today hold widely differing views, with some regarding outside elements as the decisive factors, while others believe that internal factors were more important. To do this video, we have consulted works from both camps of historians, but inevitably, one group was more convincing to us, and this video is leaning closer to the views of historians like Dr. Peter Heather, who regards outside factors as the most important catalysts in the fall of Rome. Before jumping into the fall itself, at first, we need to look at the Roman Empire on the eve of its collapse. 27 BC is the date that historians traditionally used as the starting point of the Roman Empire. Four centuries later, in 376, the Romans were still in control of the Mediterranean world, and could rightly call it Mare Nostrum. So it is tempting to regard the 4th century Roman Empire as the same entity that was established by Emperor Augustus. Though there's no doubt there were elements that Augustus or his uncle Julius Caesar could have recognized in the 4th century Roman world. Still, more than 400 years had passed from the ascension of Augustus to the reign of Theodosius the Great, the last emperor to rule a unified empire, and the empire of Theodosius was a very different animal to the empire of Augustus. A major change between the early empire and the late empire was the reduced importance of the city of Rome itself. Though the eternal city still held a highly prized symbolic value, from the rule of Diocletian onwards, emperors seldom visited Rome and rather chose to reside in cities that were closer to the frontier. Thus, by the late 3rd century, emperors chose to hold their court in cities like Trier, Mediolanum, Ravenna, Nicomedia or Constantinople. Another major change contrasting the late empire to the early one was the fact that from the rule of Diocletian onwards, generally, the Roman world had more than one emperor. Diocletian came to power following five tumultuous and civil war-ridden decades, which saw the rise and fall of more than 30 emperors, most of these men perishing at the hands of their own soldiers. One recurring scenario of the 3rd century crisis was when the borders of the empire were threatened on multiple fronts. Despite his immense power, not even a Roman emperor was capable of being in two places at the same time, so to deal with the threats, emperors were forced to delegate power and sizable armies to their subordinates. But once victorious, many such subordinates turned on their master and marched to depose him. Diocletian was a tough career soldier who saw the rise and fall of several emperors, and when he took the throne in 284, he was determined not to share the unfortunate fate of his predecessors. Once secure in power, he decided to split the empire and named a trusted companion called Maximian as his co-emperor. From then on, Diocletian ruled the eastern half of the empire, while Maximian ruled in the west. A few years later, Diocletian decided to further subdivide the empire by promoting another two men, Galerian and Constantius Chlorus, to the purple. According to Diocletian's system, he and Maximian were the two senior emperors, titled Augustus, while Galerian and Constantius were the junior emperors, titled Caesars. However, Galerian and Constantius were to succeed the senior emperors when the time came, and their place was to be taken by another two junior emperors. It was a clever system. Nonetheless, it soon disintegrated following the abdication of Diocletian in 304. And following two decades of civil war, Constantine the Great emerged as the sole ruler of the Roman world in 324. 
Still, this unification was not to last for long, as Constantine's sons divided the empire following their father's death, and Rome was only briefly reunited when the Constantinian dynasty narrowed down to a single man, Julian the Apostate, in 361. Julian ruled the unified empire until his own death in 363, but his successor similarly divided the empire and the last man to rule a unified empire, Theodosius the Great, also divided it between his sons in 395. The imperial administration and the army did not escape the winds of change either, and by the late 4th century, both differed greatly from their counterparts from the age of Augustus. Up to the 3rd century, the imperial bureaucracy was minuscule, but the tumultuous 3rd century forced the emperors to expand it significantly to extract more efficiently the resources of the empire. This move was needed to finance the expanded Roman army, which may have increased by as much as 50% by the time of Diocletian and Constantine. Estimates vary about the exact size of the army, with some believing it to have been as large as 600,000, while others believe a lower number, ranging in the 420,000 as closer to the truth. Even the lower number sounds impressive, but considering the sheer length of the Roman borders and the empire's population, which may have been as high as 70 million, the picture looks instantly different. In comparison to the France of Napoleon, not to say anything about the Prussia of Frederick the Great, Rome had much fewer soldiers per civilians, and a barbarian army of 20,000 to 30,000 attacking a single point in the frontier more often than not easily outnumbered the defenders they faced. The structure of the army also changed significantly. Previously, the troops were stationed on the borders of the empire, but by the early 4th century, the Roman army was divided into border guards called limitani, and mobile field forces called comitatenses. The border guards were still stationed on the frontiers, but the mobile field forces were located behind the borders and were tasked to deal with invaders who penetrated the frontier. The successes of the late Roman army in protecting the borders from the reign of Diocletian to the disastrous defeat of Emperor Valens at Adrianople led many historians to regard the later Roman army as superior to the early one, though this view is far from universally accepted. According to the critics, the development of the later army was as much due to administrative and personal security reasons of the emperor as anything else. Change did not escape the outlook of the provinces either. Following the Roman conquests, the local elites in the provinces went through a process of Romanization, and by the 4th century the elites of Gaul, Hispania or North Africa considered themselves true Romans and were loyal subjects of the empire. Nonetheless, this loyalty had its limits. As the wealth and status of these elites was due to their extensive landholding, their loyalty to the Roman state was secured by the ability of Rome to protect their property, and with it, their status. Finally, another major change inside the empire was the rise of Christianity. Constantine the Great heavily promoted the Christian church during his reign, and his successors except Julian the Apostate were all Christians. By the late 4th century, the elites of the Roman state were increasingly Christianized, though it needs to be said the empire at that moment was still far from universally Christian, and pagans were still found in high military and administrative positions alike and the majority of the population in the rural areas of the empire were probably pagans. Besides going through major internal changes, the Romans also had to contend with political changes that developed outside their borders. According to Professor Heather, by the 3rd and 4th century AD, the population of the Germanic tribes living outside the borders of Rome increased considerably in comparison to the 1st century AD. Furthermore, powerful entities like the Franks, Alemanni and the Goths had also emerged in Germanic Europe, whose chiefs were capable of mobilizing tens of thousands of soldiers to face the Romans, like the Alemanni in 357, when Emperor Julian faced a Germanic army numbering between 15,000 and 35,000 at the Battle of Strasbourg. Changes also occurred on the eastern borders of the empire, where the Arsarsid Parthian dynasty was replaced by the more aggressive Sassanid dynasty, who turned out to be a more formidable foe. In the 3rd century, Shapur I, for example, defeated several Roman emperors and devastated the eastern provinces of the empire before the situation was brought under control in the 280s and the 290s. Other changes, of course, also occurred in the lead-up to the fall of the Western Empire, but due to the death of written accounts, the economic and monetary crisis that hit the empire during the 3rd century crisis and to what extent these were involved by later emperors, if at all, is difficult to understand. 
The exact consequences of the plagues that hit the Roman world in the 2nd and 3rd century are also difficult to measure. Historians are divided in their opinions about the role these events had in the transformation and, later, fall of Rome. The bottom line is the Roman world and what surrounded it were significantly changed by the 4th century to what it looked like in the 1st. And in truth, in unluckier circumstances, Rome could have collapsed during the 3rd century crisis. Yet it didn't, and thanks to some emperors like Aurelian, Diocletian and Constantine, Rome remained strong well into the late 4th century, and it is really a source of irony that the domino effect that eventually led to the fall of the Western Empire actually began in the East, with the arrival of the nomadic Huns. Bursting onto the plains of modern-day Russia and Ukraine, in the 370s, the Huns defeated the Alans and the Goths, prompting the Thervangai and the Grithungai Goths to seek asylum inside the Roman Empire. These Goths, numbering perhaps as many as 200,000 men, women and children, arrived at the Danube in 376. The Romans agreed to allow the Thervangai to enter, but the Grithungai were denied entrance. Corrupt Roman officials soon tried to use the migrants to their own benefit by selling food at extortionate prices, leading to the revolt of the Goths. The local commanders tried to defeat the gods, but they proved incompetent and were defeated, leaving the gods free to devastate the countryside with impunity. Following their victory, the Thervangai were joined by the Grithungai, and groups of Alans and Huns also joined them in devastating the Balkans. While things escalated in the Balkans, Valens was fighting against the Sassanids in the east, and was unable to return to the Balkans for the moment. With the assistance of Western reinforcements sent by Valens' nephew Gratian, the Goths were fought to a standstill in 377, but victory eluded the Romans. Valens returned to the Balkans in 378 and planned a joint attack with Gratian, but egged on by his impatient officers, Valens engaged the Goths before Gratian's arrival and was defeated and killed at the Battle of Adrianople. With him perished two-thirds of the Balkan field army. Following his uncle's death, Gratian raised an experienced soldier called Theodosius to become the new Eastern Emperor. Theodosius tried to rebuild the Eastern Army in the following years, but he failed to defeat the Goths and made a compromised peace with them in 382. The Peace of 382 broke with centuries of Roman settlement policy of breaking up migrant groups and settling them in different areas of the Empire. Unable to defeat the Goths, Theodosius allowed them to settle inside the Empire as a cohesive group, in exchange for which they were obliged to assist the Emperor in future campaigns. The Goths honored the agreement and served the Emperor faithfully in the 380s and 390s, assisting Theodosius in defeating Western usurpers who deposed his allies Gratian and Valentinian II. With his victories, the Emperor briefly reunited the Empire in late 394. However, Theodosius did not live long enough to enjoy his successes and died in January 395. He decided to divide the Empire between his sons, with the younger son Honorius becoming the Western Emperor while the older Arcadius became the Eastern Emperor. As both sons were still too young, regions ruled in their name. In the West, it was Flavius Stilicho, a half-Vendal, half-Roman general, who became the power behind the throne. Stilicho also wished to take power in the East, but the Eastern court resisted his attempts. Not long after the death of Theodosius, the gods chose to rebel against the Romans, and led by their king Alaric, they devastated the Balkans. Stilicho marched against them twice, but a combination of Gothic military prowess and politicking from the Eastern court foiled his attempts to destroy Alaric. Seeing Alaric as a useful ally against Stilicho, Eutropius, de facto leader of the Eastern court, made a deal with the Gothic king and enlisted him as an ally, giving him command in the Eastern army and the ability to raise taxes to support his own. The deal lasted until the fall of Eutropius, but his successors had no interest in continuing the alliance with Alaric. Shunned by the East, Alaric invaded Italy to force a deal out of Stilicho, but the Western general repelled Alaric's invasion of Italy. Four years later, another Gothic king, called Aragadisus, also attacked Italy, but once again, Stilicho prevailed and defeated the invaders. Nonetheless, to gather enough force to confront Aragadisus, Stilicho depleted the Rhine frontier, a crucial blunder that was to cost him dear a few months later. After defeating the Franks, a Roman ally, a group of Vandals, Alans and Suevi broke through the weakened Rhine frontier in the winter of 1406-1407 and fell upon Gaul. Simultaneously, usurpers rose in Britain, the most successful of whom, called Constantine III, crossed into Gaul in the spring of 407. 
Enlisting some of the barbarians in his service, the usurper defeated Stilicho's general Sorus and took over Gaul all the way to the Alps. Sometimes in this period, Stilicho enlisted Alaric in his service, agreeing to grant him rank in the Roman army and land to his people, if, in exchange, he would help him against the usurpers. Unfortunately for Alaric, Stilicho's inability to deal with the usurper undermined the western general, and he was killed before he could enforce his deal with Alaric. Stilicho's successors, however, committed a serious blunder in late 408, when they incited mobs to massacre the families of the Germanic soldiers of the army of Italy. Outraged, the Germanic federati deserted en masse to Alaric, who, with his enlarged army, invaded Italy and besieged the city of Rome itself. Alaric, in reality, had no intention of sacking Rome, but was trying to blackmail the emperor to keep up Stilicho's deal. However, he underestimated the importance of the city to the imperial regime, who refused to agree to his terms. Rejected by the emperor, Alaric sacked Rome in 410. Following the sack of Rome, Alaric planned to cross into Africa, but storms destroyed his ships and he died quickly afterwards. He was succeeded by his brother-in-law, who led the Goths out of Italy into Gaul. Following the departure of the Goths, a capable soldier, Flavius Constantius, rose in the west, and under his leadership, the imperial regime went on a counteroffensive between 411 and 421. Constantius defeated the usurpers in Gaul and succeeded to enlist the Goths into his service. He agreed to grant them land in Aquitaine in exchange for Gothic support against the Vandals, Suevi and Alans, who, in league with another usurper called Gerontius, partitioned Hispania among themselves. With the assistance of the Goths, Constantius reconquered parts of Hispania, though not in its entirety. By the time Constantius died in 421, the imperial regime of Ravenna succeeded to re-establish control over Gaul and more than half of Hispania, but Britain was lost to the empire for good. The long wars also damaged the local economy of the provinces, forcing the Roman state to grant large tax reductions, which impaired its ability to rebuild the army to its previous strength. Had Constantius lived longer, he may have succeeded in further strengthening the Western Empire, but he didn't. No man of his stature emerged following his death in 421, and when Emperor Honorius died in 423, the Western Empire was once again in civil war. With the assistance of the East, Constantius' son, Valentinian III, took the throne. But as he was a child, it was his mother, Galla Placidia, who ruled in the boy's name. Galla tried to maintain a balance of power between the three dominant generals of the Western Empire. Felix, commander of the army of Italy, Aetius, commander of the army of Gaul, and Boniface, commander of the army of Africa, but only succeeded until 433, when Aetius eliminated his rivals and became the dominant figure in the Western Empire. From 433 to his death in 454, Aetius was a de facto ruler of the West, and with the assistance of Hunnic mercenaries, he campaigned successfully in Gaul, but Roman forces were pushed back in Spain, and the Vandals and Alans conquered North Africa, the most prosperous province of the Western Empire, leaving the West on the verge of bankruptcy. To make matters even more complicated, sometimes between the 400s and 430s, a rival superpower developed in Central Europe, the Hunnic Empire. Luckily for the West initially, the Huns concentrated their efforts against the Eastern Empire, and their leader, Attila the Hun, defeated the eastern armies on numerous occasions in the 440s, but by 451, Attila ransacked the Balkans and had to look for other targets. Using a ring sent by Valentinian's sister as his casus belli, Attila invaded Gaul in 451. Aetius lacked the power to resist the invasion on his own, but secured the assistance of the Visigoths, some Alans, Franks, Burgundians, and other barbarians and narrowly defeated Attila at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains. Still, the Hunnic leader was not broken yet, and he invaded Italy the next year. But an outbreak of a disease in his armies forced him to retreat after sacking Aquileia. Luckily for the Western Empire, Attila died in 453, and with his death, his empire began to disintegrate. Unluckily for the empire, with the death of Attila, Valentinian believed he no longer needed Aetius and killed him with his own hands. This was a crucial mistake, as the army was more loyal to Aetius than Valentinian, and the emperor was murdered just six months after Aetius. A messy period followed, that saw the rise and fall of two emperors in quick succession until the capable Majorian took the throne in 457. On his ascension, Majorian controlled little more than Italy, as both Hilaria, Gaul and Hispania refused to recognize him. 
Through a combination of diplomacy and military success, he won over the local elites of these provinces, and in 460 he planned to launch an invasion to reconquer Africa. His planned invasion, however, was thwarted by sabotage, which destroyed a large part of his fleet, hired by Gaiseric, the clever Vandal king. With his invasion thwarted, Majorian disbanded most of his army and returned to Italy, but his friend Reisimer turned on him upon his arrival and had him deposed and executed. Reisimer set up a puppet emperor, but his authority was only recognized in Italy and southern Gaul, while Majorian's loyalists in Illyria, the rest of Gaul and Hispania succeeded. From this moment onwards, the emperors were little more than pawns in the hands of ambitious generals. One final attempt to re-establish the Western Empire was launched in 468, when a joint Western-Eastern fleet was assembled to transport a large army to reconquer Africa. But Gaiseri surprised his fleet and defeated the Romans at Cape Pon. Following the defeat, the Western Empire collapsed very quickly, with the Visigoths overrunning Hispania and most of Gaul. By 476, the Western Emperor ruled little more than Italy, but his own revolting soldiers deposed Romulus Augustulus and his father Orestes in 476. Their leader Odoacer could have set up his own puppet emperor, but he chose not to. He sent back the imperial symbols to Constantinople and contented himself by ruling Italy in the name of the Eastern Emperor Zeno, though in reality he was as good as the independent king of Italy. Odoacer deposition of Romulus Augustulus finally brought an end to the Western Empire, and Western Europe was not to see the rise of another emperor until 800 when Charlemagne was crowned by the Pope. In the end, the fall of the Western Roman Empire did not have a single reason, but events unfolded as they did thanks to a combination of civil wars, foreign invasion and structural changes inside the empire, all of which were necessary to lead to its demise.